Thank you, thank you, Rashan. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. We are so excited to see everyone. And uh, um, let, let us first introduce ourselves, and then I'm going to uh, tell uh, what's, um, what is our outline of the webinar. So my name is Daria, and uh, I'm NYU Abu Dhabi International Outreach uh, Officer in Russia and Central Asia. And uh, today I'm accompanied with my colleagues, uh, Lubov and Hanna. Uh, Lubov, Hanna, please introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. My name is Luboy. I'm working with Daria. Uh, I'm NYU Abu Dhabi um, International Outreach Officer working in Russia and Central Asia countries. Welcome to our info session. Hi, everyone. My name is Hannah McEwen, and I'm the Assistant Director of Admissions at NYU Shanghai, and I am the Territory Manager for NYU Shanghai for Central Asia, Mongolia, and Russia. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, today we have a very uh, extensive webinar. So we first, um, me and Hannah, are going to introduce you to two of our campuses um, and in general talk about our university, to talk about our network, exciting network, and all of the opportunities that you uh, have. Um, and then uh, we're going to walk uh, you through the application process. We will tell you how we uh, look at your uh, applications, then we're going to talk about the extracurriculum activities, and we have uh, um, some activity about essay writing, so uh, this will be the part for you to participate and share your thoughts uh, about essay writing. So without further ado, uh, let me start. Um, so, um, and let's start from where it all has started. And uh, New York University and its campus in New New York was founded in 1831 by Albert Gallatin, uh, and the founding philosophy of NYU uh, was a to make a university without walls, accessible to everyone uh, who lived at that time in the city, who, uh, for everyone who wanted to have an access to a higher education. And now it's one of the largest private universities in the United States, allowing you to study on six different continents. Now it is comprised of 10 schools schools and colleges. So from the very beginning, it always been a university of many parts that make up the whole. And uh, the value of NYU education is more than just an NYU degree. Uh, it's an access to our entire system, all of the resources uh, that our students can uh, tap into as a part of the global uh, uh, network. And uh, when I'm talking about the global network, I want you to introduce to uh, that footprint that we have uh, across the whole global uh, globe. So uh, here you see our three degree granting campuses, which is in New York, Abu Dhabi, and Shanghai. In a couple of minutes, I'm going to introduce you to Abu Dhabi, and Hannah is going to introduce you to Shanghai campus. But before that, I wanted to say that we are not limited to only these three campuses. All of our students have an opportunity to spend uh, a semester or up to two semesters abroad in one of our 12 exciting academic centers. So uh, one of uh, our recently opened academic centers is located in Los Angeles. So students who are, for example, interested in media studies or film studies or creative studies, they can go to the heart of Hollywood and um, study there. If you're, for example, interested in economics, you can go to London. Um, in uh, If you're interested, for example, in arts, you can go to Paris or to the Florence. Or um, if you're uh, studying engineering, you can go to one of our, uh, to our Brooklyn uh, college, uh, college in Brooklyn uh, in New York. So this is a very exciting opportunity for students uh, to travel abroad to explore the city and this is the core philosophy of our university. Um, 
is uh, an international university. And um, the second degree granting campus was open in uh, Abu Dhabi in 2010. So um, it, it has been a second degree granting campus and um, uh, where you could uh, come to study in NYU Abu Dhabi for four years and graduate with a bachelor's degree. And it was the first liberal arts institution to start in the Middle East as a fully integrated American institution and the research institution. Uh, the university's population is quite unique. Uh, people are coming from all over the world to live in the United Arab Emirates. And the same uh, thing is happening as mirrored in the students' population of NYU Abu Dhabi. So approximately 89% of Abu Dhabi's population is from uh, all over the globe, making it one of the most unique and most uh, diverse student population uh, you will be. Uh, so now we have around 1,800 undergraduate students coming from more than 115 uh, countries. And of course, then speaking more than 115 languages. And uh, uh, NYU Abu Dhabi, and in general NYU, it's a liberal arts institution. So at NYU Abu Dhabi, we offer more than 25 uh, majors in arts and humanities, social sciences, uh, in science, technology, and math, in engineering. And uh, uh, when you're applying to uh, NYU, uh, at NYU, you we don't expect you to know what major you are going to uh, to study. So um, you can choose it uh, later. So this is an opportunity for you to experience uh, different subjects, different topics. Um, and again, this is how we prepare you to be um, a well um, uh, a good professional. So, and uh, um, at NYU, uh, we at NYU Abu Dhabi, we also offer multidisciplinary minors that goes along with our uh, majors. So, uh, on the screen, you can see uh, the list of minors that we offer. And of course, being a very international campus, we offer. Um, um, different languages that you might learn. And one of the uh, popular questions that we get is, um, do I need to know Arabic when I'm applying and do I need to study Arabic? Uh, so answering both of those questions, no, we don't expect you to know Arabic and we don't expect you to learn Arabic while you are learning at the, while you're studying at the NYU Abu Dhabi. But if you want, we do provide classes uh, in Arabic as well. So, and uh, uh, moving uh, forward, I have told you that uh, you are going to experience a very uh, international student body, but uh, also it's important to mention that our educators, our professors are also coming from around the world, uh, from uh, across the whole globe, and they are very well established educators, um, and uh, all of our students um, have an opportunity to do a research alongside with uh, our educators um, because we are a research university. Uh, research is very important and it is a part of education in all of the majors. And it's a unique opportunity for you uh, being a bachelor's degree, like doing your bachelor's degree, still doing your research together with um, our professors. And uh, of course, uh, we are talking a lot about uh, the uh, your classroom studies, but of course, uh, as any American university for us, it's also important how you spend your time outside of the classroom. So at NYU Abu Dhabi, uh, at NYU Abu Dhabi, we offer a lot of um, extracurricular activities, like, for example, sports, and probably any sports that you would mention right now, I would say that you have an opportunity to experience it at NYU Abu Dhabi. Uh, we have an Olympic-sized swimming pool, uh, football, um, 
uh, we have uh, basketball, uh, table tennis, uh, tennis, uh, archery, uh, kayaking, so anything. And of course, we also offer um, more than 40 student interest groups uh, that you might join and experience and find uh, students who are experiencing and having the same interests as you. So, and for example, if there are no interest group uh, that might interest you. Uh, we offer an opportunity for you to establish your own interest group. If, or for example, you find um, around 10 students who would be interested as well in that topic, and uh, then you can uh, prove it to the university that um, uh, this club has a lifelong um, experience and the university helps you uh, with establishing your own interest group. Um, and uh, um, I want to quickly introduce you to, of course, uh, to our campus. Um, and uh, it's um, a big campus uh, which has all the facilities on campus. All of the students live on campus. So um, it's, uh, um, as our students call it, it's like a bubble uh, because you don't really need to leave uh, campus. You can find everything on campus. You live on campus, you study on campus, you spend your free time on campus. We have a lot of restaurants, cafes, uh, we have art center, theater. So anything that might, uh, Everything that you need, you can find on campus. And the campus itself located on the Saad Yad Island, which is uh, from the Arabic, it means the island of happiness. And this is the same island where the Louvre Museum is located. And we are only 15 minutes away from the downtown of Abu Dhabi. Um, so if you want to go to the downtown, which is also a very diverse and vibrant city, you, our students can easily uh, get there. We have a transfer uh, provided to our students. And, um, uh, like the main idea we that uh, we follow and uh, we want to get and to make our students and then our grads to uh, be comfortable anywhere and effective everywhere. And one of the frequently asked questions, uh, what is happening after I graduate NYU Abu Dhabi or in general NYU? So, um, and uh, here I wanted to tell you that um, uh, at NYU Abu Dhabi, we have uh, more than uh, 14 Rhodes Scholars uh, in the last seven, five, seven years. And if you don't know what is a Rhodes Scholar, it is the most prestigious scholarship that you might get uh, to, uh, to enter graduate studies in the University of Oxford. So, and um, uh, most of our students are very successful in terms of finding jobs uh, within the six Six months after graduating, they find the full time jobs. And we also have a career center that helps you and navigates you throughout all of your four studies. And they help you to find your scholarships. Uh, they find uh, they help you to find your um, uh, opportunities of work. And for uh, for those of you who wants to continue studies, uh, we also all of our students are well accepted to such universities as Harvard University, uh, to the Oxford University, Cambridge, uh, to the London School of Economics, uh, to the Parsons uh, University School of Design in New York. So uh, this is a very well uh, known universities and our students are very successful in applying to the graduate st studies and the graduate level of those uh, universities. And um, now um, uh, we will get to the contacts uh, later. Um, I would like to give a floor to my uh, colleague, uh, Hannah, to represent uh, our amazing Shanghai campus. Perfect, thank you so much, Daria. My name again is Hannah McEwen and I am the Assistant Director of Admissions at NYU Shanghai. I'm actually the newest member of the International Admissions Team at NYU Shanghai. And I just moved to Shanghai a little bit over a year ago. I am originally from Pennsylvania in the United States and I am Korean American, so I do not speak any Mandarin or Chinese. And I'll talk a little bit more about whether or not you need to know Mandarin 
Mandarin or whether or not you'll be learning Mandarin as an NYU Shanghai student later on in this presentation. Um, so if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide, that would be great. So before talking about NYU Shanghai, I am actually curious to see what you think about when you think of China. Do you think of a serene scene in nature, maybe like in picture one? Um, or maybe you think of modern skyscrapers with 5G technology, like in picture two, or maybe you think about temples and traditional Chinese history as seen in picture three. So feel free to drop in the chat box what you think about. Is it nature? Is it the modern scene? Um, or is it more of a traditional scene? I'm curious to see what you think of when you think of China. Great, so, oh, I see some of you saying one or two, all of them together, a mix, great. Well, there is no right or wrong answer. Um, China looks very different depending on where you are. The country is full of urban cities as well as mountains, hills, highlands, and even beautiful beaches in the south that remind a lot of people of beaches in Hawaii or Bali or even in Thailand. In fact, Shanghai looks very different depending on where you are. Every year, our students come to NYU Shanghai from all over the world with varying levels of experience in China and with many of them never having stepped foot in the country before. Our students are often surprised by how big Shanghai is and how the diverse the city is. And just for reference, Shanghai is actually bigger than New York City in size as well as in population. Sometimes students are very surprised to learn that. Next slide, please. While our campus is located in a huge city, we have a student body of a little bit over 1600, which allows for a tight knit community and that home away from home feeling. Chinese nationals from all over China make up 50% of our student population. And then the other 50% are international students from 70 different countries from around the world. Um, and if you take a look at the picture on the screen, you will see the famous Shanghai skyline with the Oriental Pearl Tower, that is that pointy building there um, in the center. Um, and if you Google Shanghai, you will likely get pictures of those really cool futuristic looking buildings. Um, we are actually located very close to those buildings. You can see them from the top floor um, of our current academic building. Next slide, please. So if you take a look at the map, you can see where we are currently located, again, near the Pearl Tower as well as the Shanghai Tower. But for the start of the fall 2022 term, so um, you know, a little bit less than a year from now, we will be moving to a new campus, which actually broke ground in May 2019. And we are building it from the ground up with our exact desired plans that current students or alumni actually had a voice in designing. And I think it's really cool that our students will be sitting in classrooms that either they helped to design or alumni helped to design. Um, our new campus will allow us to double um, our current capacity. And then just like our current campus, our new campus will be equipped with state-of-the-art facilities such as classrooms, labs, lounges, an expansive library, a fitness center, cafeteria, and so much more. And then in addition to everything that's offered on our campus, keep in mind that as an NYU Shanghai student, you'll be located in the heart of Shanghai. We have one of the easiest and most convenient public transportation systems anywhere. I have lived in New York City um, and also been in public on public transportation systems all over the world. And I must say the one in Shanghai is really easy to use um, from our current campus. Um, as well as our new campus, we are only a few minutes away from major metro stops that connect our students uh, to the rest of the city. Um, I do want to mention that when you are on the metro or the subway system, um, all of the signs are in Chinese as well as in English and all the announcements are made in English as well as in Mandarin. So again, it is really easy to get around in Shanghai.
And this ease of access really allows our students to leverage different opportunities around the city that make Shanghai itself an extension of our campus. Um, and really whether you're interning at one of the world-class financial institutions um, or going on trips to really neat art galleries, you'll find that your education at NYU Shanghai is meant to take advantage of all the opportunities that are found all over the city of Shanghai. Next slide, please. So I do want to share with you two pictures of what our new campus will look like. These are renderings because again, we are still building the new campus. Um, the building will be made up of four structures with a quad in the center. A quad is a central courtyard that a lot of US universities have in the design of their campus. Our quad will be full of green space, which is obviously really neat being that you will be in a major city. And a lot of times there's a lot of times there's not a lot of green space in major cities and that green space will be available just for our students faculty and staff since our campus will be gated uh, next slide please um, so we know that moving to china is a big deal and it can seem really scary but we will support you before you even arrive uh, during the summer before your first semester you will meet an orientation ambassador other first year students as well as your academic advisor and then when you finally arrive, the bonds that are formed through our unique student body really start from day one in our residence halls. This is where, you know, lifelong friendships are truly formed. Housing is guaranteed for all four years and first year Chinese students um, and non-Chinese students room together. Um, the benefit of this is huge. Not only will you be living with someone from a different culture, but you will likely gain a lifelong friend in the process. Um, students are required to live on campus um, for their first two years um, at NYU Shanghai, but again, housing is guaranteed for all four years if you choose to live on campus all four years. Um, and then as far as what you should expect living in our dorms, each room comes with amenities like beds, desks, chairs, closets, um, and uh, for each roommate and then each floor has communal bathroom sinks as well as shared kitchens, washers and dryers. Uh, next slide, please. And then when it comes to student life, there is so much to take advantage of outside of class, whether you have an interest in dance, uh, sports, politics, science, the environment, or even restaurant and board games, there is a club available to you. Um, if you wanna check out different options, we do have an involvement fair at the beginning of every academic year that you can take part in. A lot of students oftentimes get together and maybe even start their own club. So that's also a possibility. Um, we also celebrate Violet Pride and Ally Week, and we host an annual dumpling festival, which of course is a very delicious and yummy <laughs> event. Um, and then beyond that, Remember that you are still in Shanghai and there is so much to take advantage of and explore. If you love coffee or if you are a bubble tea lover, there are really so many options all over the city. Um, and if you are a foodie, there are so many great places to eat eat and cheap places to eat. Um, one thing that is really unique about the NYU Shanghai campus is we do not have a meal plan at NYU Shanghai. And that is simply because not saying that the food in our cafeteria is not great because it is, but our students wouldn't take advantage of a meal plan because there are really so many great places to eat all over Shanghai. And then we also have everything from big brand name stores in Shanghai, um, as well as small, you know, shops that sell one of a kind like handmade crafts here. So you can find a little bit of everything in the city of Shanghai. And really the community that you form, that's up to you. Um, and being in Shanghai, you will never run out of things to do. Uh, next slide, please. Great, so at NYU Shanghai, um, all students come in as undecided and have two years to declare a major. Um, and that's a little bit different from the New York City campus where you would need to apply to a specific school or college at NYU and kind of know what you already want to do. At the NYU Shanghai campus, you do come in as undecided. Even if you have an idea of what you want to major in, the way our system is designed is that you come in as undeclared 
declared undecided and then have two years to declare a major. You can choose from 19 different majors across a wide range from business to STEM majors, um, social sciences and humanities, and then even a very unique major to our school known as Global China Studies. And that really explores the ways in which the world has impacted China, as well as China's role in the modern world. Um, we also do have pre-med and pre-law offerings if you are interested in attending medical school or law school in the United States. Um, additionally, it is possible to declare a second major and have multiple minors, as well as even at our campus, you can even design your own major by drawing from different disciplines across NYU Shanghai. And then you also need to work with a faculty advisor if that's something you choose to do. Next slide, please. So I just want to be clear, um, our language of instruction is English at NYU Shanghai. All classes are taught in English except for Chinese or other world language classes. And you do not need to know any Mandarin in order to apply. In fact, the majority of our international students start from the very beginning. But the good news is, is that all students will be proficient in Mandarin by the time that they graduate. Um, I will say sometimes that can seem really intimidating. Oh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to need to learn Mandarin. Yes, it is one of our requirements at NYU Shanghai for international students. Um, however, it's interesting because a lot of our students who have never had any experience with Mandarin often say that Chinese is their favorite class. So it is a requirement for our international students um, to take the language. Um, but if you're just starting out, keep in mind that you will be learning Mandarin in Shanghai and that gives you the opportunity to be immersed in the language and practice whenever you're out and about in Shanghai. So that means, you know, if you're at the grocery store or maybe you're ordering at a restaurant or even spending time with your Chinese friends, your Chinese roommates, you can practice what you are learning in class whenever you want. And then if any of you are already learning Chinese or Mandarin, um, we do have more advanced course offerings um, to really help you practice what you already know and really perfect your Mandarin from the start. So no matter what your level is with Chinese language, when you come to NYU Shanghai, we will tailor your education to make sure you get the most out of your experience. Next slide, please. So just like our student body at NYU Shanghai, um, our faculty also come from diverse backgrounds. We do have about a third of our professors that come from China, but then the rest come from all over the world. And having easy access to these very diverse and incredible minds really allows for unparalleled mentorship and research opportunities from the very beginning of your college experience. Uh, we do have a small student body. Remember, we have a, our student body is a little bit over 1,600 students, and our student to faculty ratio is just seven to one. So that means that all classes are being, you know, taught by faculty members who expect to really get to know their students because the class sizes are so small, and also be mentorship figures to them through their network of professionals, as well as you know, collaborating with them through research. Um, students at NYU Shanghai can actually start doing research from very, very early on. So if that's something you're interested in doing, um, we have a lot of opportunities for our students to do research. Um, and we even have uh, funding for students to do research. Uh, so that means that you can get paid to do research and the Dean's Undergraduate Research Fund. So sometimes if you're talking to NYU Shanghai students, they'll call it DERF. Um, it's one of those funding uh, sources that we do have for research. Um, and it can be used actually anywhere in our global network. So that means that you can use it maybe at a different site um, as an NYU Shanghai student. Next slide, please. So um, as an NYU Shanghai student, you will actually be earning two degrees. You'll be earning a Bachelor of Arts or Bachelor of Science degree from NYU, which is the same one you would be earning at any three of our degree granting campuses. And then you'll earn a second degree from NYU Shanghai, which is a Chinese diploma certified by the Ministry of Education. And a lot of times students are like, how does the Chinese diploma help me? Well, 
if you love China after you graduate and you want to stay in China, it allows you to do so and it allows you to get a work visa in China. Typically, in order to get a work visa in China, uh, you need to have a bachelor's degree plus two years of uh, work experience in order to get a work visa. Um, but with having the Chinese diploma that allows you as, a, um, as an NYU Shanghai graduate to stay in China and work um, for certain companies. As far as preparing students for life after they graduate, we also have a career development center. center. I know Dario mentioned uh, the one in Abu Dhabi and our career development center like the one in Abu Dhabi offers one-on-one -on -one advising, workshops on important work skills and they also host career fairs. And then they also help students search and secure uh, internships. And then as a senior, you will tie in everything you've learned with a senior capstone project, um, which is an advanced research project, often called a thesis, and that really prepares students for life after they graduate, um, going to grad school, and really, you know, even going out into the workforce. Um, next slide, please. Um, so you may be wondering what NYU Shanghai students are doing after they graduate. You can find our graduates studying all over the world or, and working all over the world. In fact, 61% of our graduates from the class of 2020 are living outside of their home countries, um, with 74% of our graduates having a second major or minor. And I think that just describes the type of students that we have at NYU Shanghai. They like to stay abroad and they have many different interests. 94% um, of the class is either working or pursuing advanced degrees. And then you can see where our students are attending um, school or graduate school after they graduate from NYU Shanghai, as well as some of the places that they are working. But in addition to what you see on the screen, we also have students working at places like Google, JP Morgan and Adidas, and also pursuing advanced degrees at places like Stanford, MIT, and the University of Tokyo even. Um, if you want to see more about what our students are doing after they graduate, you can actually check out our graduate destinations reports on our website. Next slide, please. So that is my contact information. And again, we can share it again at the end. My personal contact information is up there. It's hannah.mc at nyu.edu. Again, I am the outreach uh, or the territory manager for NYU Shanghai for Central Asia, Mongolia, and Russia. And I'm pretty familiar because I also read applications from those different places. So I'm pretty familiar with the education systems within those different countries. So if you have any questions, feel free to shoot an email to our general admissions account, my personal email email account and you can even um, talk to a student if you'd like to from NYU Shanghai by going to shanghai.nyu.edu slash ask a student. So if you submit a question through the ask a student page, uh, actual current student will respond to you. So thank you so much for, you know, uh, listening to me talk about NYU Shanghai, but I am going to turn it over now to Daria, who will talk to you a little bit about under, uh, to talk to you about applying. Thank you, thank you, Hannah. Um, so um, I will uh, give you a quick uh, overview about first steps uh, that you're gonna take uh, if you want to apply to uh, one of our campuses. And then um, Hannah will talk more about uh, how we review uh, your um, like applications. So um, when are you going to apply to NYU or any of our three campuses, you are going to apply through the common application. Uh, it is an uh, online platform um, that is used by more than uh, 900 US universities. And if you want to apply to all of them, you can use only one uh, platform. But of course, we're not recommending to apply to all of 900 universities. Uh, be wise um, and thoughtful. Uh, but again, uh, you will need to fill in only one application to apply to a multiple universities. Uh, US universities. But of course, every university is going to have their uh, school specific questions. And, and at NYU, we do have school specific questions, but we're going to talk about them a little bit later. So um, when you're applying, you're applying through the common application. And um, 
the first step we are going to ask you is uh, what campus uh, you prefer. So when you're researching for the university, first you search for N uh, NYU. And only after that, you have a choice of three campuses. You can choose one campus, you can choose two campuses, or you can choose all three campuses. Uh, but uh, again, uh, before doing so, we uh, do recommend you to do a research to find all of the, uh, we are still a one university. We, uh, you get uh, the same uh, degree at all of the three campuses. But at the same time, we are a little bit different in terms of like the students population, in terms of our locations, and in terms of, uh, for example, the financial support. So uh, before uh, mentioning campuses, do your research and decide what campus is your top priority uh, campus. And uh, um, after that, we are going to uh, require uh, request you to submit um, your uh, transcripts uh, to, um, to provide your test scores, uh, letters of recommendation. We uh, expect you to provide two letters of recommendation uh, from your current school. And um, uh, this is the minimum. But if you would like to provide more recommendation letters, you are free to do so. Um, and uh, um, um, what is specific to uh, NYU Abu Dhabi, as part of your application, we also have a candidate weekend. Um, this is very specific only to NYU Abu Dhabi. Um, so all of the successful and selected students are invited for a candidate weekend. Uh, this is the... Um, uh, yeah, uh, this is the event uh, where you have an opportunity to be introduced to the campus, uh, to, to show yourself, uh, to demonstrate yourself. Uh, and after that, we do a final decision regarding uh, all of the applicants. Um, and uh, uh, then I wanted to talk more about the deadlines. So at NYU, in all of our three campuses, we have three uh, decision deadlines. Um, we have uh, early decision one with the deadline in November the 1st. We have um, early decision two uh, with the deadline in January the 1st, and we have regular regular decision with the deadline in January the 5th. Uh, the main um, uh like the question that we usually get a lot, uh, what is the difference uh, between early decision and regular decision? So um, uh, early decision uh, is a binding agreement, which means that uh, if you are accepted through the early decision, university expects you to, uh, to um, uh, to accept the offer and withdraw any other applications to any other universities. So if you are, for example, very sure about uh, NYU, um, and you want to express it and show us that uh, NYU is your top choice, uh, top priority university. Uh, that is why you apply through the early decision. Um, the differences between uh, how we read your application, there are no differences, whether it is early decision or regular decision. The, the only uh, difference is that um, if you apply early, uh, the university also uh, promises to give an, an early decision to you, an early uh, reply to you. So you will know the, uh, the status of your application very quickly. Uh, now, um, now, I think that this is part of Hana. Hana, would you like to, to talk more about the application components? Sure, yes, I can talk about the application and components. So your application is made up of your academics as well as your personal um, side of your application. Um, I'm going to talk more about academics and then Daria will talk more about essays, extracurricular activities. She already talked about how you would go in to apply using the Common App, which again, you would apply um, to all three of our campuses in that same way. Um, so next slide, please. 
great. So I am going to go over first um, understanding the academic review uh, process. Um, I know I did mention um, that I read for NYU Shanghai um, in addition to doing outreach and I read thousands of applications. Um, and a large part of reading applications involves reviewing a student's academics. So I'm going to go over how we review academics. Uh, next slide, please. So each application comes to us with an academic profile, which is comprised of, for the most part, a student's grades, standardized testing, and for some English language testing. And I know we I've been looking at uh, the questions in the chat box, and I hope that after kind of going over um, how we review academics, it will answer a bunch of the questions that I see coming in about academics. Uh, next slide, please. I do want to mention, because I am going to talk about grades, that all of you are so much more than just your grades. We do obviously need to make sure that you are academically prepared to be a student at NYU. So we do obviously need to look at your grades to see how you are performing as a student. Next slide, please. Um, in order for us to review your grades, uh, your high school counselor will need to submit your high school transcript. A transcript is a detailed record of all the subjects you have studied or the classes you have taken with your scores, marks, or grades. It may look very different from the one on the screen, and that is okay. I have even reviewed transcripts um, or report cards that are handwritten, so they may look nothing like the example that is there on the screen, and that is completely fine. No matter what your transcript looks like, we typically need to see your grades for your last two to three years of high school or secondary school, sometimes it's called, as well as your grades for your current year um, in high school or secondary uh, school. Uh, your transcripts do need to be translated in English, um, need to be in English or translated into English um, in order for us to review them. So please keep that in mind when you are submitting transcripts. And again, this is all done through the common application and by your high school counselor or whoever you have indicated as your high school counselor. Next slide, please. Um, so, oops, sorry. Um, so another key piece of information that we look like that we look at when we are reviewing academics um, is your school report, and this is also submitted by your high school counselor through the Common App, and it gives us more information about the school that you attend, the curriculum at your school, your GPA and class rank. If your school has those things, and we are fully aware that not all schools do, do have GPA and class rank, and that is fine. Um, your school report really provides us with context when we are reviewing your academics, um, and especially when we are unfamiliar with a specific school. Um, I do want to be clear to be clear that we are not comparing you to students from other countries or other schools within your same country. Um, we are looking at how you perform at your specific school, the one that you are attending. So I always like to say um, we are not comparing apples to oranges. We are looking at how you perform at your specific school and the school report does give us some context and more information about the type of school that you are attending. Next slide, please. Um, one way uh, we look at academics is also, um, and, and deciding what type of school that you are attending, is we look at the rigor of your curriculum. So the type of school that you go to and the classes you are taking. And what I mean by that is we ask, are you challenging yourself? with the types of classes you are taking. Your high school counselor, or again, the person that you have indicated as your high school counselor will mark this on your school report. So there will be a section where they will need to indicate what the rigor is of your school. And they will have the different options that you can see on the screen, starting with exhausted all the way down to standard to choose from. Uh, I do want to mention that we do have an internal rating system that we use for rigor at NYU when we are ranking um, the rigor of your high school. 
So we don't always agree with what your high school counselor has indicated on your school report, and that's okay. Um, and if you are unable to choose your classes, a lot of times that actually means the rigor of your curriculum is standard, and that is also completely fine. Um, we will know that by looking at your transcript as well as your high school report. And if, you're, if your rigor is standard, again, that is completely fine and you will not be disadvantaged if you cannot select your classes um, and you can only take the standard curriculum that is offered at your school. But the again, the school report and the, how your counselor ranks your rigor and what we can see from your transcript scripts as far as rigor goes, the classes that you're selecting does help us when we're reviewing your academics. Uh, next slide, please. Um, another component that we look at when we are reviewing academic is trends in your academic performance. Um, has there been an upward trend? So that means has, have your grades gone up um, or has there been a downward trend? Maybe your grades have gone down a bit. Um, we also look at whether or not you have been taking classes that have been progressively getting harder. Um, a good example of that type of progression would be students who are taking like biochemistry and physics. Typically those courses are an indication that you're taking classes that get harder and harder as your years go on. Um, we also look at the time of year and year to year. So maybe your grades typically start off low at the beginning of every school year and improve throughout the school year. Uh, maybe you have done better in one school year. Maybe you did better in ninth grade than you did in 10th grade. Um, maybe your grades have gone up and down. Um, or maybe you're really strong in certain classes and not so strong in other classes. Those are really the trends that we look for and what we note um, and what we review when we are looking at your academics. Um, so next slide, please. The next piece of information I'm going to go over is standardized testing because it is always a big question that we get. Students have a lot of questions around uh, standardized testing. Uh, next slide, please. So NYU has a test flexible policy that allows students to submit any number of exams to meet our standardized testing requirements. And our online tool on our international qualification page allows you to see if your country's exams are accepted. So that means, no, you are not required to submit SAT or ACT. Um, you can submit any number of exams in order to meet our standardized testing requirement. You can actually scan the QR code that is on your screen to bring up our international qualifications page where you can select the country or region you are from and it will tell you the different tests that we accept from your country. However, I do want to be sure I mentioned this and I believe Daria also mentioned this briefly. Um, NYU does recognize that there has been a continued struggle with COVID-19 um, and also students getting to testing sites um, in order to take standardized tests. So while we still welcome you to submit test scores in line with our standardized testing policy, we will not require them for the 2021-2022 application cycle. And you will not be disadvantaged during the application review process if you do not submit standardized testing. I do also also want to mention though, if a standardized test is required for you to graduate, so in some countries you do have to take a test in order to graduate for high, from high school, you will be required to submit your scores for that because your score for your high school, like for leaving high school, is considered a part of your high school transcript. It's not, it's, it's considered a part of your high school transcript as well as standardized testing. So you would need to submit that if a standardized test is required for you to graduate from high school. Next slide, please. So the next piece of information I'm going to talk about about academic, that's related to academics is English language testing. And the reason why we group this with academics is because obviously the language of instruction at all of our campuses is English. So we obviously need to make sure that you are proficient in English and will be able to learn and do well as a student at any of the campuses that you will be attending. Next slide, please. So um, on the screen is our English language 
proficiency policy. So if English is not your first or primary language, you may be asked to submit results from an English language proficiency exam taken within the last two years as proof of English proficiency. On the, on the next side of the screen, you will see reasons you do not need to submit English language testing. So if English is your first or primary language, you do not need to submit English language testing. And then if you already completed at the time that you are submitting your application, which may be very soon, hopefully, um, three or more consecutive academic years in a curriculum where the only language of instruction was English, you do not need to submit English language testing. I do want to mention one thing. As we are going through and reviewing your application, if we realize, oh, hey, this student actually does need to submit like certain components of their application, like maybe you need to submit English language testing and you did not submit it, or maybe there's a piece of your application that is missing that we need more information, we will reach out to you. So please make sure you are checking your email even after you apply. And we also a lot of times send emails to your high school counselor as well if we are missing something. Next slide, please. Um, we do accept a variety of English proficiency exams, and you can see them up there on the screen. We do accept the TOEFL, the, um, the IBT. Um, we do accept results from the in-person version or the IBT home edition. We do accept dual lingual English tests. A lot of times I honestly suggest this one to students because you can do this from the comfort of your own home. Um, we also accept the IELTS academic uh, English test or the Pearson test of English academic, um, or the C1 advanced or the C2 proficiency, as well as the ITEP. We do not accept results from the IELTS indicator um, or the TOEFL essentials or the PTE academic online. So that's just to give you an example of the different English proficiency exams that are accepted. If you'd like more information, we do have more information about those different proficiency exams on our website. Next slide, please. And now we are going to move on to the activity section um, of the application. So Daria, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. And um, uh, thank you for such an extensive information about the applications and how we review them. And um, I looked through the uh, chat. We still have so many questions regarding uh, uh, English testing. And of course, we still have a lot of questions about the activity section and essay writing. So now let's move to those two sections. And um, here is uh, here is a snapshot of the activity section uh, Common App uh, is going to, uh, to have. So uh, in the Common Application, you will add up to 10 activities. Some schools uh, may ask for a resume or activity sheet, but most will not. Uh, remember, this is another part of the common section of the common application, so it is important to fill this out in a way that, um, that is universal to your application. So, for example, if you founded an NYU Appreciation Club um, at your high school, um, that will be cool for, for us, for NYU, but if you're applying to any other universities, maybe it won't be that cool for other universities universities. Um, activities are what you do inside and outside of your classes, uh, but are, aren't limited uh, to, let, as we call them, traditional involvements, uh, like sports or student government. Of course, mention them, but uh, definitely uh, talk about uh, jobs, family responsibilities, etc. We want to know about them all. Uh, this helps us imagine uh, what type of community member you are going to be, uh, because uh, all of our campuses are close-knit communities, and we want to know more uh, of your personality. We want to know what type of a community member you are going to be. Uh, now now that you are thinking about what kinds of activities you should include in your application, let's talk about some tips of making this section really stand out. 
Uh, start with the most impressive and uh, don't make us wait until activity eight uh, or activity nine to learn that you are, for example, an Olympic gold medalist. You don't want uh, to bury your best or most important achievements uh, somewhere down the road. Uh, put them uh, first. Think about grouping similar activities, so all of your, for example, community service or sports or leadership clustered together, because it is easier for us to read your application. Um, admission officers uh, might know some of the most common acronyms, like, for example, Model UN, uh, but they might not know uh, all of them. So make sure that uh, what you provide doesn't leave any room for confusion and it doesn't make us to research. So uh, explain all of the acronyms um, and be very thoughtful um, and think whether what you write would be understandable and easy to read to the admission officers. It's okay if you don't have, for example, a measurable outcomes for all of your activities, but if you are the leader of a club or other community group, think about what you have accomplished over your involvement. How is that club or a group uh, better off after you have participated? What contributions uh, did you make and uh, what did you bring to the community? Like, for example, you've started some uh, interest group and you've started um, with only two people in that group and um, um, only after some of the activities that uh, you've made, uh, the size of this activity group uh, doubled or tripled. So, and, or maybe you've been the only uh, representative of your school in some of the competitions. So think about all of those achievements and how you can illustrate uh, your participation in this or that activity. Uh, lastly, it may, uh, may not be the great idea to join 35 new uh, clubs uh, at your senior year. Um, and it's not really necessary for us. Uh, while multiple activities uh, can give us some information about you, sustainable commitment speaks volumes. So of course, um, we want to see all parts of your personality. We want uh, you to be well-rounded and uh, um, but again, uh, we don't recommend to to apply and to start uh, being active only at your uh, your final year and uh, joining like 20 new clubs. So really be again, very wise and thank, uh, thoughtful about this. And um, now um, let's uh, talk about the writing section. Uh, it is again, very exciting part uh, and the most, I would say difficult part. And it really takes time and it really takes, um, uh, Again, yeah, it takes time for you to prepare for this uh, section. Uh, so leave enough space and enough time for you to prepare. Um, this is where you get to take your application into your own hands and tell your own story. And it is where we get to learn what kind of personality you are, what kind of a community member you will be on our campus. Uh, some colleges require you to complete a main common application essay, uh, while others will not. So in that slide, you see that, for example, if you have selected New York University, you will see that New York University requires you to write um, a personal essay uh, in one of the topics that is provided in a common application. And we are going to talk about that uh, in detail later. Uh, because this essay goes again to multiple universities, 
it's not the right place uh, and the right time to talk about your specific major or a specific school, a university you're applying to. Uh, save that for the supplement. Uh, we do want to know what you love about the colleges you are applying to, but this main essay is purely for us to get to know you better. And uh, here are all the essay prompts uh, for this upcoming year. It doesn't matter which essay you choose, which topic you choose, uh, and most of the topics are very broad enough uh, that you can write about whatever you want. Uh, the essay should ultimately be one that is true to you. Uh, if you care about social justice, write about social justice. If you are funny, be funny. If you are not funny, probably it's not the right time to start being funny. Um, so don't make it uh, as well as a resume. Feel free to be vulnerable and to be honest with us. Uh, we are looking for you to tell us your own story and um, to share what you want to share with us. And um, this is uh, the uh, screenshot of the common application uh, where you are going to write your essay. And if you pay attention, you will see that the maximum, uh, like the limit of your words is 650 words. And uh, the common app doesn't accept the um, essays which are uh, less than 250 words. So in this words limitation, in those uh, words range, you have a chance to write your essay. Uh, you should definitely write it in another document uh, in case uh, for any changes uh, to make it safe. Um, and uh, But when you are copy pasting, please um, make sure that you double checked uh, everything uh, because everything you see here, this is how we see it when we receive your application. Uh, it always helps to break your essay up Dense blocks of text are harder to read and prevent us from seeing the important points. So think about using shorter paragraphs, dialogues or headings so that your story flows smoothly. And uh, let me give you, before we go into an interactive part, before I will show you some of the examples, let's talk about tips. Um, this doesn't have to be your traditional English class essay. So the par five paragraph format uh, could be good for some essays, but it is not necessary for each essay. Uh, don't focus so much on making it different uh, that I like that we don't learn anything about you. This is really your only opportunity to share your story for NYU because NYU doesn't offer any interviews. So your essay is an opportunity to speak with the uh, admission officer. Keep it centered to yourself, even if you are writing about how big an impact your grandma had on your life, she is not uh, the one who is applying. We want to know your story, so don't focus it on your grandmother. Uh, stories from the past need to be connected to, uh, to present or to the future. Um, and. Um, this is a general college essay, so again, to be, be careful about any references to any, any specific institution. And uh, this is a fine line between personal and too personal. Um, until uh, you are feeling comfortable expressing yourself, express yourself. But um, this is, again, the question that we really get a lot, how personal I can be until it is comfortable and until uh, it makes it doesn't make us uh, feel stressed or that you are trying to influence on us, it is okay. So again, uh, this is there is still a fine line between being too personal and personal. And uh, now um, let's uh, talk about uh, the activities. Uh, let's have like an activity section. And I'm going to um, go through uh, different um, examples um, and I'm going to read them out loud and give you uh, some examples of those uh, of starting points. And I would love you to share your opinion uh, what is the most effective way to start. 
So the first prompt in the common app is some students have a background, identity, interest, or talent that is so meaningful they believe their application would be incomplete without it. If this sounds like you, then please share your story. And now I'm going to read you three examples, and I want you to write in the chat box which one do you think is the most effective one to start. I'm of X nationality, which means I speak in this unique way, have these unique traditions, and eat these unique foods that I bet you have never heard of. The second one, I want to study business. I excel in these classes, and I want these awards. And the third one, I don't just listen to music. I'm an avid musicologist. Let me tell you about the opera of my life and in particular, the last chapter, my jazz stage. So um, please share your ideas in a chat box. Okay, I see that some of you choose the first, the third, but the most of you have chosen the third one. Fantastic. So um, let's look at them and uh, discuss. So um, the first one is not the best and the greatest example because it really reads like a Wikipedia entry. Um, as Hannah has already mentioned, we read a lot of applications from so many different nationalities. Is. And uh, mm, that is why when we receive uh, a lot of applications from, for example, from Kazakhstan or from Russia or from any part of the world, uh, you need to be unique. You need to differentiate yourself from uh, the same person from the same country, from the same school, from the same region that you are coming from. So, um, so mentioning that you are from X nationality and eating the special and unique foods, it's not really unique for, for us because there could be other applicants from the same background as you. The second example, again, is not the strongest one because we can see those uh, examples from other parts of your application. We could see that you have already started studied business or that you excel in those classes. Remember that essay is your unique opportunity to speak with us and share some unique information that we couldn't find in any other parts of your application. And the third example is an interesting start. It's an interesting hook. So uh, we would be definitely intrigued to learn more about uh, this student, to learn more about these interests of the student. Now let's move and uh, to the second example. The second prompt sounds like the lessons we take from obstacles we encounter can be fundamental to later success. Recount the time when you faced a challenge, setback or failure. How did it affect you and what did you learn from the experience? And there are two examples. I failed grade 11th month because I had a teacher who didn't know how to teach well. I want to study engineering and I know I will do better with a good teacher. And the second example, as I started my final lap in the pool, the entire crowd was cheering, including every, uh, every other swimmer, all of whom had finished long before me and were grabbing their towels. If I uh, set any record that day, it only could have been for the slowest time, but without my participation, my school could have not been even qualified. So please share your ideas, which one do you think uh, is the strongest one? Great, fantastic. I like your opinions. So uh, it's really uh, great that you see the differences and that you see why uh, the first one is not the great one. So um, talking about the first example, it really um, shows that student fails to take a responsibility and assigns blame and expresses really poor, uh, poor academic fit as well. So obviously it is a bad example used to highlight uh, the, the, your application. And the second example is uh, a good one because student tells a lighthearted story which showcases a positive characteristics. Uh, the student cares about um, um, their school about the students and it doesn't take um uh, doesn't take this situation too seriously. So um, 
even taking a, a setback, the student have an opportunity to show uh, the uh, advantage of it. So uh, this is a very effective way to start your uh, essay as well. Uh, now let's move to the third example. Reflect on the time when you challenged a belief or idea. What prompted your thinking? What was the outcome? And the examples are, in my culture, a man aims for a good career and the woman should aim for a happy family. I don't think this is fair. And the second example, growing up, no one even spoke to me about engineering. It didn't seem like an option for a girl. By 10th grade, I had uh, subscribed to two magazines, five YouTube channels, and my top Google result were how do you make or how do you take apart. By 11th grade, I held our school's first made by girls meeting and had 20 elementary school girls bringing in clock to deconstruct. This year, our first meeting had 60 girls. So, um, please share your thoughts about these examples. Okay, good. Okay, good. Um, so you're, uh, again, uh, most of you are right uh, by choosing the second one. Uh, so, uh, because the first one really uh, lacks any evidence that the student took action to express their principles. Um, and it also presents the student is taking a really not diplomatic approach in uh, proving her, uh, her thoughts. And again, in the second example, uh, it's a good concrete examples of your achievements and how you impacted your school, impacted uh, the group uh, that you have joined. Um, and um, uh, the student here we uh, would recommend and would like to see why uh, did this matter to you so don't forget or uh, only to provide evidence but also tell us why it was so important for you so why starting this group was important for you why this achievement is important for you but again uh, the second example is the most effective example because it illustrates what the student have achieved uh, looking at the uh, sorry at the fourth example, describe a problem you have solved or a problem you'd like to solve. It can be an intellectual challenge, a research query, or an ethical dilemma. Anything that is of personal importance, no matter the scale. Explain its significance to you and what steps you took or could be taken to identify a solution. And uh, the, there are three examples. Poverty is the world's uh, number one problem. I would try to fix this problem by eliminating greed and creating equality. The second example, my country sends many brilliant students abroad, but suffers severely from brain drain. I would like to start a global internship program that lets students know they don't need to sacrifice a good job to return home. And the third example, last weekend I spent one hour in the mall and then another full hour in the taxi line outside. The second hour inspired me to think about a career in urban planning. I will create a city where a family remembers um, their outing by the experience in their destination, not the experience in the taxi line. Um, again, I would like to hear your thoughts. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm so happy to see you that you are so involved. involved. Thank you. Um, okay, great. So um, again, uh, the first example, I'm glad that you all see that the first example, again, is not the best because it's a classic beauty pageant answer. And this is simplistic and really only shows that the student doesn't understand the complexity of the problem, that one person can't solve the poverty around the globe. And the second example uh, could be a good one if students successes, su uh, succeeds in explaining 
why the brain drain is a problem for his or her country and what will be your challenges in attempting to work on this problem. And the third example is really relatable, shows uh, insights, uh, shows the background. The emphasis here is to show that one doesn't need to tackle the whole problem on a global level to show their ability to analyze and problem solve. So looking at the fifth prompt, uh, discuss an accomplishment, event, or realization that sparkled the period of personal growth and new understanding of yourself or others. And the examples are, my mother left when I was 12. That was the year uh, I mastered cooking and omelet, turning my little brother's tears into giggles, and most importantly, learning what was my fault and what was not. And this is the second example. When I turned 16, I got my driving license. No more relying on my parents. I was finally free. My friends and I went to the movies all the time and even to the beach on the weekends. We had so much fun and felt like an adult. Uh, so please uh, share your opinion. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for your thoughts. Uh, you are, again, absolutely right. Uh, so uh, the first example uh, explains and um, shows that um, the student has overcome some challenges. And while it's not a singular, singular experience, if the writer can bring to life their specific situations, specific examples, and show how they grew and changed due to this event, it could be a very effective essay. And the second example, uh, really raise the question, how is this experience different from your peers uh, who also got their driving license? This response really very generic and doesn't prove um, your seriousness uh, when you're applying to, uh, to, uh, to the university. And then uh, let's look at the sixth example. Uh, describe a topic, idea, or a concept you find so engaging that it makes you lose all track of time. Why does it captivate you? What or who do you turn to when you want to learn more? And the examples are, I like to write. When I need to make my mind of things, I use a pen and a paper and get all my feelings down on that paper, piece of paper. Once I start writing, I lose all track of time and sometimes don't know when to stop. And the second example, the hours pass, day turns to night, and only my mother calling me down to dinner breaks the spell I'm under. Without realizing it, I had spent yet another afternoon with my needle or, and the thread. The small red and black triangles, diamonds and squares are not just shapes to me. They are my family history laid out in cloth. I was only nine when my grandmother taught me that the art of embroidery and the, um, as she showed me the stitches and patterns uh, that were unique to our village, my fingers literally itched with excitement to start working. Now I would like to hear Fantastic. I really like that Rasul uh, wrote that it's like a part of a, a good book. Fantastic. Um, you are right that the student have used uh, this chance to write it as a novel, to write it as a story from a book. That is why it is a very effective and very exciting way and really motivates us to read more uh, and to feel us to be as a reader, to be as someone who is writing it. So this is a truly an effective way to, to write an essay. And uh, the first one um, is not that effective because uh, it is very generic. And uh, uh, when you are answering this one, avoid using I love to because it doesn't demonstrate genuine passion for a topic. Um, and we want you to give more examples. Uh, yes, um, thank you, that it's really a good use of a descriptive language, uh, that is why it is a very effective way. And um, the seventh prompt, it's a generic one, so it doesn't ask you any question, so uh, you can choose any 
essay or any topic of your choice. Uh, but I would want to give you some um, advice uh, that uh, make sure not to write about something that is strictly academic. So it shouldn't be an academic essay. Remember that it is still a personal essay. Write something about your personality. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, so this would be uh, my advice about the seventh prompt. And now um, finishing up my examples, um, I want to talk about um, at the beginning, I said that um, when you choose the university you are applying, some of the universities will be accepting your personal essays through the common application, but some universities will have school specific questions and when you're applying to NYU or any of our three campuses, you will be asked a specific question, which is why NYU, because we want to know why you choose our university, and we want you to be very specific about it. So here is um, uh, how it, this part of the common app looks. So uh, this is where you choose uh, your, um, the, the uh, again, you choose your uh, university. And then here is where you will write why and why you, you here you will express uh, what really interests you, uh, what motivates you to apply to our university. And the maximum uh, words uh, limitation for this particular essay is 400 uh, words. And um, I would give you some tips on writing this particular essay is before you start writing this essay, please do your research. Uh, try to find what really motivates you. Um, if you are applying to only one campus, then uh, investigate and do your research uh, what is uh, very unique about this particular essay, about this particular campus. If you're applying in general uh, and want to talk in general about NYU, you are free to do so. And uh, what we don't really want to hear there is uh, you telling us uh, that you are the best university, that is why I'm applying to you, or that is why, because you are um, in like in the ranking system, you are in top university. Again, this is not what we want to hear. We want to know the real motivation behind that. And of course, um, one of the common mistakes students do when they are answering this, um, they are just copy pasting uh, this essay to each university. And sometimes this is so disappointing to read a really go good uh, essay and then at the end to see the name of the other university. Please be careful, please don't do this mistake. Um, and again, when you are writing this essay, we want to know specifically why and why you and believe uh, we read so many applications that we will really easy understand that uh, whether it is a unique essay or this is the used essay you use to multiply to multiple universities. And here is just for you as an example, why uh, you are applying to your dream school? Why are you applying to NYU? The first example, I am applying to dream school because it is ranked number one and it is the best. So as I said, this is not an effective way to to write and start writing this essay. And then here, let's look at the second example, which is a really great one. My high school history teacher taught us about the Cold War by sharing his experience of living in a post-Soviet Russia. He taught us about European history by talking about the, his experience living in Paris. We learned about art history by hearing about the museums he had visited in Florence. I was in awe of the way he had learned about the world and now NYU Abu Dhabi in my, is my chance to do this. I want to learn about Ethiopia through the roommate from Addis Abeba. I want to learn about China through a G-term class in Shanghai. I want to learn about the marine environment while kayaking through the mangroves in Abu Dhabi. 
It really illustrates uh, an effective way that the student went on our website, double checked uh, the student life, uh, double checked that it is a very international campus, that all of our campuses are very international, uh, that you will have an opportunity to meet students from across the world. So this really illustrates that the student made the research and explains uh, his or her motivation to apply to our university. And um, the additional information, Hannah, would you like to, uh, to talk more about the financial uh, uh, how about the financial support at our campuses? Yeah, I can talk about additional information and also fi financing your education. So there is a section where you can add additional information. Please do that. If there is something that you feel is not highlighted, through the rest of your application, through your recommendation letters, through any other piece that is already there, a part of your application, please add additional information. Keep in mind that we are aware that all students around the world have been impacted by COVID-19 and a lot of students all over the world have also been taking classes remotely. So for instance, if you are taking classes remotely, we don't need to know that. Typically your counselor will also mention that um, when they are submitting documents for you. You. Um, however, if there's if you have been impacted in some um, big way, I would say that we cannot see from looking at the other components of your application, please make sure to include that in your additional information. So just to give you some examples of sometimes what we see in that additional information piece that is helpful for us is sometimes students um, may be super sick um, like for an extended period of time throughout their high school career. Sometimes students unfortunately have end up having a specific disease or something like that. They'll mention that in the additional information section of their application. Um, we've had a few students who are professional athletes who have been traveling around into different countries. They will also mention that in their additional information just so it's clear um, that they were traveling a good bit of their high school career. So again, anything that we cannot see from looking at the other components of your application, it is worth noting in the additional information. But again, if you were, you know, just taking classes on not, I don't want to say just taking classes, but if you were taking classes online due to COVID-19, we are aware that most students across the world were also doing that. So you don't need to note that there. But if anything else, please make sure to mention that in the additional information section. And now I'll talk a little bit about financial aid. Um, that's really the last piece, excuse me of this presentation before we go on to Q&A. So we understand college is an investment and we are committed to working with families to make it a financial reality. No matter what your citizenship is, we do offer financial aid. Um, most international students need to complete the CS or all international students should complete the CSS profile. Um, and that can be found on the College Board website. The website is up there on the screen. Um, if for some reason you are a US citizen who is tuning in today, um, and I know this is obviously for students from Kazakhstan as well as other areas of Central Asia. So for the most part, you are likely not US citizens. But if for some reason you are, you will want to submit the FAFSA as well as also the CSS profile. But for everybody else, you should be submitting the CSS profile. The deadlines for the CSS profile, if you are applying in our early decision round, um, the deadline to submit the CSS profile is November 15th. If you are applying for early decision two, the deadline for the CSS profile is January 15th. And then if you are applying in our regular decision round, um, please make sure that you submit the CSS profile by February 20th. Um, just to be clear, our financial aid deadlines that you see up there on the screen are different from our application deadline. So our application deadlines are actually before all of those. Um, so just make sure that you are aware of those deadlines. Different universities have different deadlines for their financial aid. Those are ours at NYU um, through across all three of the degree granting campuses. Um, we do offer two types of financial support at NYU. So that's merit-based scholarships that are purely based on your academics. And you do not have to apply separately for those different scholarships. You apply 
through the CSS profile if you would like any type of financial support, and you will be considered for merit-based scholarships when they re are reviewing your financial information. And then we also have need-based scholarships that are based on your family's financial um, situation that can come in the form of grants, which is money you do not have to pay back after you graduate, or loans, which you will eventually need to pay back after you graduate. Um, again, in order to be uh, considered for either type of financial support, you need to make sure you fill out the CSS profile. And please do not wait to the last minute to fill out your CSS profile because it is it can be a quite lengthy process of, because sometimes you need to get different documents um, and most of the time you need to sit down with your parents or parents in order to fill out the CSS profile because it is based on your family's income, not just your income. Because most students that are in high school, well, some may be working, but most for the most part, they are not. So it's your family's income. So please make sure you fill that out in addition to obviously filling out the common application. Um, so yeah, uh, that's about it for us. Um, I know we have a lot of questions um, in the Q&A. Um, are you okay with me getting started with just answering Absolutely. a few questions? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. So I did see that there were some questions. The first one was about applying to two or three different NYU campuses and will that lower your chances of being accepted to your primary campus? The answer to that is no, it will not affect your chances of getting into your primary campus that you have selected on the Common App. So if you put you know, NYU Shanghai or NYU of the W or NYU New York as your first choice campus, that does not mean that the other campuses will steal you from your primary campus that you have selected. We each review your application individually and then go from there. Um, I just wanted to add the um, frequently asked question, um, if I'm not accepted by, for example, NYU Abu Dhabi, can I apply to NYU Shanghai? So um, no, uh, you will be accepted only by one uh, by one campus. So um, at the same year, you like when you're applying, you selecting the campuses you are interested in, but the offer of the admission you will get only from one campus. Yeah. Yes, that's very important to note. We do get those questions a lot. Like sometimes students will apply to NYU Shanghai, they'll get sometimes, unfortunately, a rejection letter, and then they'll ask, well, can I go to one of the other campuses? And the answer to that is no. Again, you were only admitted or denied from one campus, and that is your answer for all of the different campuses that you have applied to. That's great. That's definitely important to note. Um, I saw we had a question about unweighted versus weighted GPA and what that means. So unweighted GPA is typically a GPA that is out of a 4.5 scale and not all schools even have GPA. So if your school does not have a GPA system, don't feel like you have to input a GPA or your counselor needs to input a GPA. Again, we look at transcripts and we are looking at, you know, applications from all over the world and we are familiar and we are obviously aware that certain schools don't have that. Weighted G GPA means that your school has typically a general curriculum or general courses that students take and that would be like unweighted just your regular classes that you take and then sometimes they have more difficult courses so i'll give you an example of schools in the u.s um, students that come in with a weighted gpa usually that means their school is offering general classes but then they're offer also offering like ap courses or ib courses and honors courses and those courses are weighted so their gpa is weighted because they're taking general courses plus more difficult courses. For the most part, a lot of students are applying with just unweighted GPA. So if your school just has a general curriculum, then it would just be unweighted. Great, thank you. Uh, we do have a lot of questions about the scholarship, about the total scholarship and what uh, like documents would you like to uh, provide? Would you like to answer that question? Yeah, sure. So one thing that is really important to note is the admissions team does not have 
any access to your financial information at all when we are reviewing your application or even after we are reviewing your application. Our financial aid or support team is completely separate from the admissions team and they are the ones that receive all of your documents as well as everything that you submit through the CSS profile. Um, you will need to go to the CSS profile um, and, and obviously go through that application system to see the different documents that you need. If we need anything else from you, our financial aid team will reach out to you to let you know, but please make sure you are completing that um, and to the best of your ability and submitting everything that it is asking for through the CSS profile. Um, really, that's all that I can really give you as far as advice on financial aid, because again, we don't see any of that information when we are reviewing your application. Um, I do want to, uh, I saw several questions in the chat about SAT scores. Um, and, you know, students asking, well, I, I did take the SAT. Do I, can I submit it? Should I submit it? And we get those questions quite a bit. Um, students are able to take the SAT or have already completed the SAT and want to know if their scores are worth it to send them in. I do want to share something with you. I'm going to share it in the chat to everyone. Um, if you click on the link that I just shared in the chat box, you will see some NYU facts, which will give you an idea of the different admission statistics. So if you click on that link, you will be able to see what the middle 50% range of students who are first year students at NYU across all three campuses submitted as their SAT scores and ACT scores. So that middle 50% range means that also 25% of students who are first current first year students at any of the three NYU campus campuses submitted above that for their SAT. And then 25% of those students also submitted below what you see there, the middle 50% range. So that will give you, the middle 50% range should give you an idea as to whether or not it would be worth it for you to send in your SAT or ACT scores. I always say, if it will help your application, send your SAT scores. Um, if you don't think it will help your application, obviously do not send your SAT scores. Um, and I also said, saw that we had a question about the IELTS and whether or not we need your official scores or if you can just scan, send a scanned copy of your IELTS scores. Last year, due to COVID, we were asking students to just send us a scanned copy of their IELTS scores. And actually, I'm sorry, I should, back up a little bit, we need your counselor to send us a scanned copy of your IELTS scores, um, not you. So it needs to come from whoever you noted as your high school counselor, and it needs to come through the common application. So even if you send us your IELTS scores, we cannot accept them. They need to come from your high school counselor. Yeah. Uh, we also have a question, do you have a CSS fee waiver? Uh, yes, uh, we do provide a CSS fee waiver. And I also had a question about what interesting tradition special events do you have uh, in NYU Abu Dhabi? Um, so um, I, I would say that one of the traditions, uh, first traditions that our students experience is of course a candidate weekend. Uh, so this is a unique opportunity for students to experience um, uh, life on campus, to experience uh, what it is to be an NYU Abu Dhabi student. And then when you be um, becomes an NYU Abu Dhabi student. Uh, we also have a first week, uh, which is called Marhaba week. Marhaba in Arabic means welcome. So this is a welcome week um, that is, uh, you have so many events um, that are, awaits you and our current students uh, from the second or the third um, uh, uh, classes that uh, they welcome you, they pre, uh, organize uh, many events for you, they overtake our Instagram page, so they share what is going on on campus. So the these two events like Candidate Weekend and Marhaba Week are the events that are always mentioned by our students and even by our grads when they remember their life on campus. But of course, as I've said, we have more than 
40 interest groups and each uh, interest and student group organize their own events like uh, different festivals, different uh, holidays, um, if we're talking about like some national holidays by some of the groups. So uh, the life on campus is very vibrant. So this is uh, every time some something is happening. And of course, uh, a lot of art students organize uh, a lot of arts event in our art center, in the theater. So uh, this is always something that you can experience. So um, yeah, I would answer that way. And uh, sorry, I, I, it's Lubov. Yeah. Um, I would like to answer the question concerning candidate weekend. We will have several of them. Oh, first of all, we will have the candidate uh, weekend for ED1 students, and it will be in mid of December. And uh, in in the spring, we will have two more uh, for ED2 and regular decision students. Yeah. Thank you, Lubov. And also, um, I the most frequently asked question whether the candidate weekend is going to be online uh, or uh, in person. Uh, this year, the candidate weekend is going to be hosted online. Yeah, and there is a question how we should apply for candidate weekend. It is not possible to apply. Just apply, uh, send in your um, common application, and uh, you will be invited if you one of the strongest uh, applicants. Not applicants are invited to candidate weekend, only qualified applicants. So it is the final stage of selection. Yeah. I, I can answer a little bit about our traditions at NYU Shanghai. So I did mention when I was talking about NYU Shanghai that we have a dumpling festival. And there are so many different types of dumplings all over China because food is very different depending on where you go in China. Sometimes it's very spicy. Sometimes it's not spicy at all. Sometimes it's full of seafood. So we do have a dumpling festival where students can sample different dumplings from in and around China or all over China. Um, and then we also we celebrate we also celebrate American holidays as well um, at NYU Shanghai. I'm sure Abu, NYU Abu Dhabi also does this. So last year uh, we had a huge Thanksgiving dinner celebration um, where we had great Thanksgiving food. Um, in fact, I, I feel like a lot of our like different traditions that we have at NYU Shanghai involve food. Um, we also recently had Mid Autumn Festival, which was towards the end of September, and that's a time where people here in trying to eat mooncakes. And so we had, uh, we had a bunch of mooncakes um, here for students to, to, to sample and to try. So a lot of different festivals that take place throughout China and, with NY and within NYU Shanghai involve food. <laughs> so I would say those are our big traditions, our festivals that involve food. Fantastic. So exciting. Um, um, we have two raised hands. So, um, Sultan, uh, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yes. Hello. Hello. So I have a question. Is there any club or com committee in New York Abu Dhabi that works on cultural um, culture between students? Like learning about other cultures and working about it, something like that. Um, thank you, that is a fantastic question. Uh, so um, I can't like uh, in a sport tell you all uh, and remember all of course um, clubs, but anyway, um, we have a close knit community and you will have uh, an opportunity and uh, uh, to get in touch with uh, all different nationalities. You're going to be, we have a very um, uh, like small classes, up to 20 students in a class. And mostly uh, every student uh, in a classroom is going to be from a different nationality. So you will be uh, changing all of those experiences. You're going to, uh, for example, to talk about one topic, but from so many different angles, just because you're coming from so many different uh, cultures and backgrounds. Um, and of course, while you're going to be live on campus, um, mostly all of your neighbors are going to be, again, from different um, nationalities. So uh, the most 
frequently the mixture between cultures is going to happen throughout some events or even throughout your uh, daily activities. Um, um, and um, uh, also, we have an interest group uh, that is uh, about learning different languages where students learning students uh, or teaching students. So um, you could join that club and uh, learn any language uh, that you would like. And the actual students from different countries will teach you. So again, this is uh, how uh, you will uh, be able to, uh, to, to know the different cultures so yeah oh that's very nice but uh can you do you know the name of this club uh Lubov, do you remember the, the name of that club it is uh uh no i do not remember okay just give us some time or you can just drop us a message uh and we will be able to double check it for you Oh, okay, thank you very much. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Um, and we also have another uh, hand from uh, Din Mohamed. Uh, would you like to ask a question? Yes. Um, so first of all, thank you for the session. And secondly, um, my, I have four questions, I think. So the first one is, can I send self-reported SAT scores or do I have to send them through College Board? Uh, would you like to answer? Yes, I can. And I do not have a direct answer for you because last year we started off requiring them to come from College Board. Um, and then about halfway through our review process, we found a way which we could just verify the score. So as long as like a score was coming from the counselor, we would accept those. Um, I can, if you actually, you can direct message me your email address um, and I can actually shoot you an email after this. I can check in um, with our administrative team in New York to see if we will be allowing students to just send their scores and self-report them or if we will be requiring them to be sent through College Board. Because again, because of COVID-19, we realized it was difficult for students to also even send their scores through College Board. So again, about halfway through our review process last year, we did allow students to just self-report them and then we would get them later on from College Board. So please send me your email if you wouldn't mind. Um, you can direct chat me your email address and I will get back to you. But thank you so much for your question. That is one I would also like an answer to. That's a good, really good question. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the next question is, um, during study abroad, is it possible to participate in athletic competitions? Um, that is also a great question. Um, you mean the competition organized by the university or some external ones? Uh, by university. Um, so when we're talking about like home campuses like New York, Shanghai or Abu Dhabi, we do have uh, all those sport activities where students uh, participate in different competitions. Um, when we're talking about um, our smaller uh, academic centers, like for example, in Florence or in Paris, I'm not sure that there are some big uh, sports events happening in those um, uh, academic centers. But if we're talking about uh, our home campuses like New York, Abu Dhabi and Shanghai, of course, students participate in different sports activities and um, uh, competitions. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the next question, uh, do you have any information when a business organization and society major is going to be approved at Abu Dhabi campus? Uh, Lubo, if I'm not mistaken, it has already been approved a major, yeah? It's in, in the progress, it's in the progress, yeah. and um, we, we hope it will happen as soon as possible. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, and the last one, just to clarify, yeah, so if you're not invited to the candidate week, does it automatically mean that you were rejected? Luboy, would you like to reply? But could you please repeat the question? I have some problems here. Uh -huh. uh, so 
just to clarify, if you're not invited to the candidate weekend, does it automatically mean that you were rejected? Um, if you are not invited for uh, uh, to take part in the candidate weekend, uh, it might mean that you are rejected, but you must uh, have your hope uh, because sometimes we have the situations when the students, we do not have enough spaces for all qualified students to be invited for the first for December, for example, candidate weekend. And uh, sometimes we had the situation in the past when uh, some um, number of students were qualified students were transferred uh, to take part in the next uh, candidate weekend, or it might be the situation when uh, somebody from the invited um, qualified applicants invited for the first uh, candidate weekend was not able to attend and they were transferred to the next candidate weekend. And if we have some uh, spaces here that uh, all all qualified candidates are invited. So it depends. So you must um, you must um, still hope, and um, unless you receive the information from the admissions um, concerning the um, uh, concerning their decision, uh, con concerning the status of your application. Yeah. So you should wait for an official letter from the university. Uh, until then, um, uh, everything is possible. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for the session again. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Okay, so are there any other questions, Hannah, that you have seen in the chat that you would like to reply or have, does it look like that we have answered all of the questions? Um, I'm seeing if there's anything else. I did see a question about studying away um, and like how long students, I think yeah. you can study yeah. away. Um, typically it's one semester or up to two that you can study away. At NYU Shanghai, you actually are required to study away for up to like one semester or up to two semesters. So that's obviously very unique to the NYU Shanghai campus. So obviously, in addition to coming to NYU Shanghai and being in a new environment, you will be required to study away at some point in your um, academic career as an NYU Shanghai student. Okay, so um, I think we have a couple of more minutes for extra questions if you have. Um, where we can find requirements for university applications. I think that I can drop you a link. Give me just a second. I, and I just wanted to add that I, I am sorry, I was not able to answer all the questions during the session because uh, there were a lot of questions and all questions were so great. So thank you very much for your really interesting questions, students. Um, is it, uh, there is a question, is it possible to take a gap year after being accepted? Uh, Hannah, would you, do you know how to reply that? Is it possible to take a gap year after being accepted? Uh, can I? Uh, yeah, yeah, Lubo. Can I answer? So you mean if you are admitted, but you uh, are require, uh, you require, for example, to be away from your studies for one year, in, in this case, you must ask to, to defer your studies and it is possible. Uh, um, I have example from our country when, for example, some um, male um, students, they were admitted, but uh, they um, had to go to the army for a year and the university gave them this uh, deferral. And um, after their army services, they started their own studies. Hannah, maybe you will add? Yeah, same thing. So you can definitely, so if you um, are admitted and then you decide that you um, need to take a gap year, it wouldn't be considered a gap year, it would be considered a deferral. So you would need to apply to defer. Um, I do want to be 
honest with you um, as far as NYU Shanghai is concerned. Um, we do not um, typically um, accept a lot of deferrals. Um, it has to be a really good reason why you need to defer or want to defer. So that would be something that you would need to apply to if that's something that you are interested in doing. In certain cases, sometimes it may just make more sense for you to step away and maybe apply again the following year um, if you are unable to attend that specific year. Um, but as far as taking like a gap year in the middle of your studies, yes, that's something that you can do. You would need to speak if you are already admitted and are, have already attended for a semester or a, a year, even if two years, if you need to take time away, you would need to speak to your academic advisor about taking time, uh, like a leave of absence in the middle of your studies. Yeah. Um, I did see a question about um, is NYU campuses LBGTQ plus friendly? Um, yes, we do celebrate Ally Week at NYU Shanghai. I think all of the NYU campuses do. Um, I know that we have an ambassador who would be at NYU Shanghai that'd be more than willing to talk to you about the LBGTQ community at NYU Shanghai, as well as just with NYU, um, as well as just within Shanghai in general. So if that's something that you're interested, if you're interested in the Shanghai campus and you wanna learn more about that specific community, um, feel free to either shoot me an email and I can connect you to that specific student or you can even submit a question through our Ask a Student page because that specific student is on that inbox. So they will see that message and likely respond to you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and we have a raised hand from Arujan. Would you like to ask your question? Yes, yeah, so um, passing SAT is not necessary, so IELTS is not yes. Uh, again, can you repeat your question? So SAT is not necessary, IELTS is not yes. Um, so let's talk about it. Uh, there is English requirements and when we're talking about English requirements, you can apply with either IELTS, TOEFL, uh, Duolingo, um, any English exam that we are accepting. So English requirements are uh, what we expect and that you would definitely need to provide theirs. And in terms of like SAT or national exams, uh, like any standardized exams, in the um, this um, uh, recruitment cycle, it is uh, NYU is a test optional, so you can decide whether apply with uh, standardized tests like uh, SAT or uh, national exams or SAT or whatever. Uh, or you can apply either with uh, standardized tests or you can apply test optional. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so just to add on to that really quickly, for the most part, students from Kazakhstan do need to submit English language testing, but not all students do. So if English is not your primary language or your first language, then you will likely need to take um, an or submit an English language proficiency exam. But if you have already completed um, at least uh, three or more consecutive years um, at a high school that is only in English, so you are only learning in English, then you also do not need to submit English language testing. And those requirements can be found on the NYU website. So feel free to go to our website if you need to try to figure out, do I need to submit it? Do I not need to submit it? But also keep in mind, I did say this, if you are missing something in your application, we will message you. Um, like if we need English language testing from you and it's not there, we will message you and ask you to submit English language testing if that's something we need. Yeah, so I think that we have uh, time for a couple of more questions. Um, uh, Hannah, there is a question for you in the chat. Uh, could you just... Uh...
Oh, okay. So they, your, your question. So I see a question um, that every student comes in as undecided. What kind of classes do they take? So typically students are taking core classes and core classes are required. Um, they're rooted in the liberal arts and they were, are required for all campuses. So for New York, Abu Dhabi and Shanghai. So students in their first two years are typically taking core classes. Um, and those can be from many different areas areas, many different majors, and this really allows students the opportunity to explore and try different classes out to see what they like, while at the same time fulfilling the core requirements that you will have no matter which campus you are at. Yeah, and we have two raised hands. Um, Chengiz, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, hello, I have a question that <clears throat> may I send the IELTS results after the early decision deadline? I mean that unfortunately our IELTS will be in 6th of November, so the results will be known around the 20th, 22, so like that. Um, I would say that uh, there is too long after the, uh, the close of uh, the first uh, early decision round. In that matter, I would then probably recommend to apply to early decision too. Uh, we do wait for some time, but uh, not. I would say that no longer than a couple of days after the uh, closing round. But Hannah, would you like also to add? Hey, exactly what you just said, Daria. Yeah, um, I would only leave it a few days after our application deadline um, ends um, to submit those scores. If it's long after that, I would say you need to push it to the next application around and apply in that specific round. Because I will say that if you do not have all, if we have reached out to you multiple times asking for you to submit something and your answer is, oh, um, I don't have those scores yet, we will typically ask you, do you want us to move you to the next round of applications? Um, but in that case, I would just say, since you know you may not have your scores by then, I would just suggest submitting for ED2 or even regular decision if that is better for you. You obviously want to have the most complete application as possible when you are submitting. Yeah, and I also wanted to add in that matter that uh, when you're applying, you want to be 100% sure that you would have a high uh, result. And until you get the, the results, uh, you, you uh, won't be sure that the, results, the result is enough. So when you're applying, for example, for early decision one, and the university awaits for your results, and then you get not a very high mark in IELTS, then really it won't play good for your application so it's better for you to wait the real result know that it is a good mark and then apply for example to early decision two yeah i think that's really good advice i do want to state that I always tell students, if you cannot get to a testing site to take like the IELTS or the TOEFL, do Duolingo. We had a lot of students last year who submitted Duolingo scores because you can do that from the comfort of your home. You don't need to go anywhere to do that. Um, so feel free to look into Duolingo if that's something that you are interested in or if you can't make it to a testing site um, by the time, like let's say you want to apply in EB1, um, you're not going to be able to test yet um, for your IELTS or TOEFL, I would suggest doing Duolingo. Um, yeah. Can I just uh, mention one thing? Yes. So uh, basically we have this Nazarbayev Intellectual Schools uh, which will do the test like IELTS test and somehow they always schedule it for uh, like late October. So this is like a problem that will rise uh, like basically all NAS students will ask this question. This is something that their school administration did and all their uh, NAS kids got affected by this um, decision to do the testing in like late October. Yeah, so, but as um, just Hannah said that in, in the matter that if, for example, uh, tests uh, are scheduled very late, but students really eager to apply to early decision one, that the option for them would be take, for example, Duolingo. Okay, yeah, that's good. Thank you. Um, can we just, uh, Ajari asked about like, is it possible to apply to both campuses? 
Uh, yes, you can apply to one campus, to two campus, or even to three campuses. But as we said, you will be accepted to only one campus. So uh, don't accept that uh, there will be that you will receive uh, uh, the offers from all three campuses or two campuses, and then you will be able to choose. You will get uh, an acceptance from only one campus. So, but still, you can apply to uh, up to three campuses. And I think we can take the final question. It's yes. again very uh, Nazarbayev intellectual school specific. Um, so they have a level equivalent. Uh, the schools are CAS accredited and a student is asking if you're going to accept this, uh, their final examinations. So for that specific school, you would need to apply as test optional. So that would be you are not submitting testing, but we will need to have predictions for what you are planning on earning in your A levels. Those are required from those types of schools. So your counselor will need to collect what they expect you to earn um, on those different exams, and then you'll apply as test optional. Yeah, we don't accept is as a standardized uh, test. Uh, so for uh, those particular schools, there are two options, either to take SAT or apply as a test optional or get uh, a national exam, which is Yente. Um, but uh, we don't accept the, this particular uh, NIS exam as a standardized test. Um, is anyone ready to answer the question about Falcon Dirham? Uh, or it's something that students have to check by themselves on the website? Um, sure, it's of course better to know from the students uh, themselves, but uh, Falcon Dirhams, it's an, uh, if you would uh, able to help me, but um, it, the Falcon Dirham is the internal uh, way for students to pay, so um, they earn them, um, some of them uh, use them for food, uh, but in terms of how they earn them, I think it would be better for students to chat with the current students. And we do host uh, different events where we even invite our um, alums and our grads and ask them uh, questions about their life on campus. So uh, you could join those events, uh, those webinars and ask uh, these questions question to, for example, to our grads. And in a chat box, I'm going to, uh, to pass the link to our upcoming webinars. So please um, go through that link and join our upcoming uh, webinars, uh, where you will have a, even an opportunity to chat with the, our grads. And I think that we will take the last question. Um, if I won't have a total scholarship, do university provide 50% or more scholarship? I would reply from NYU Abu Dhabi perspective that uh, at NYU Abu Dhabi, uh, uh, we can't say about the package, the uh, because every student received different package. What I can say that every student received some scholarship, but the amount of this and the package of it could be different, and uh, it could be, and the percentage again could be different. So if you have particular questions about uh, scholarships, it's better to address your questions to our financial department. Yeah. Yeah, um, sa same thing for NYU Shanghai. Again, we don't have any um, of your financial information or any student's financial information. And it really depends on the family's financial situation, as well as with merit scholarships, how you have done academically. So there's really no way for us to be able to know where you would fall. Even if you gave us a range, we wouldn't know because there are so many different factors that they are looking at when they are reviewing um, your financial piece when you submit submit your CSS profile. Yeah. So um, let's use the couple of last minutes uh, for me to get uh, to the slide where there is a contact details of HANA. So you can take a photo of it and then I will move to the contact details of uh, my contact details. Uh, give me a second. Yeah. 
here is the slide of Hannah's contact details. You can take a picture of it. And uh, sorry, and here are our contact details. Uh, my contact details, give me a second. I do want to mention that I did send our fall links, and I know you did as well, Daria, for NYU Abu Dhabi. I sent mine for NYU Shanghai. Um, I just want to plug the fact that we are having an event tomorrow for students from Central Asia, um, Mongolia, and Russia, an event. It, a lot of the information will be very similar to what I talked about NYU Shanghai tonight, um, but we will have some current students on that specific session um, from Mongolia as well as from Kazakhstan, so you can actually speak to them about their experiences as being NYU Shanghai students and you can actually go to our fall events page to register for that specific event again it's tomorrow night um really the very last question sorry uh can you please say how can I get the CSS profile fee waiver so when you're applying uh, through the common application in the uh, financial section you uh would take that you will be applying to the CSS profile and then there is a, a box like where you can uh choose that you would need a CSS profile um fee waiver so uh and after that the university provides you with the fee waiver yeah Okay, so I think that we will be finishing up here. Yeah, I um, think. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I would like. Thank to, you so much. <laughs> I would like to thank from uh, my side everyone who joined us today. Thank you very much for your participation, for your activity, for asking us uh, wonderful questions, and I would like to thank Education USA for inviting us. It's been a great, great pleasure uh, to participate, and of course, I would like to thank my uh, wonderful colleagues Hannah and Luboy uh, for taking your time and participate today as well. Uh, thank you a lot for this session. It was really great and you gave so much information and I loved how detailed everything was <laughs> and thank all the examples. It was amazing. Thank you very much. It's always such a pleasure to be a part of your events. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you very much. Bye.